This is my friend. Today, there are still some people who will look at people with disabilities as being somebody less. And that's a mistake. I'm a person. They're just like you, and they're just like me. And they have the same wants and needs and desires and likes as anybody else. I am a person. They might be cognitively impaired or they might have a physical disability, but that doesn't make them a whole lot different than you. I am a person, yes. I am a person. <laughs> I am a person. I am a person. We got it. Production funding for this program is provided by the North Dakota Association of Community Providers through a grant from the North Dakota State Council on Developmental Disabilities and by the members of Prairie Public. It's your day, I <laughs> like the balloon. <laughs> Every year, Roberta celebrates a very special anniversary, the day she was allowed to leave Grafton State School and begin her journey toward independent living. January 12th was my big one, my 40th year out of the institution. I do not have many happy memories of living there. I had no choice, no rights, no chance of being the person I knew and believed I could be. Roberta's graduation was the result of an early pilot program designed to help adults from the Grafton State School build more independent lives. I think I was one of the first people that moved out, got out of Grafton. I was proud to be out. Thanks to training and support services Roberta received in the pilot program, she rides the bus alone to her job every day, has the support to manage her own money, and is planning for a trip when she retires. Her life today is a far cry from what it had been. How we like living up at Grafton? And I said, you don't want to live there. When we were at Grafton, we didn't have any privacy. We had to take a bath with one of the other kids. We ate our meals together. We went to bed early, get up early. It was so strict there. I didn't like it. Been out of there for 40 years. Not going back. Although the state school at Grafton had been created in 1904 to provide short-term residential training, over the years, it had become an institution where people with intellectual disabilities were isolated and locked away, many for life. My first real experience with developmental disabilities was as a student at UND in a social work class. Our professor took us on a tour of the developmental center and it left a lasting impression uh, on my mind and I think was formative in why I chose this career. I think what struck me the most when we were touring, in addition to seeing people in shackles and in various states of undress and lacking privacy, the lack of, of dignity and respect really struck me. Probably as much as anything, the lack of human contact walking through some of the wards, people would reach out and they would want to, to grab onto your hand. What I realized later was that it was so understaffed that people didn't, didn't have that kind of human contact. And so to have relationships, even fleeting, with people who came through was significant. I always thought of it as the developmental center was this empty promise. 
they promise that we will help people with disabilities. We will train them. We will get them ready to go back to their local communities. And they, they never could fulfill that mission. They wanted to, but they couldn't because they never had the funding. North Dakota had more people institutionalized per capita than any other state in the country. And we spent the least on them. So things needed to change. In 1980, frustrated by the state's lack of progress, the advocacy group ARC of North Dakota, then known as the Association for Retarded Citizens, and six state school residents filed a federal class action lawsuit to force the state to improve the deplorable living conditions of roughly 1,400 individuals. We went on what was called their public tour. So this was putting their best foot forward. And when we walked through the developmental center and they showed us what they showed to the public, we were offended. Everywhere you went, there was enforced idleness. Nobody was doing anything. Complete boredom. There were places that we saw on the public tour where there was urine and feces on the floor. The smell in the facility was horrible. And these, again, were their best places. With the benefit of the litigation, we were allowed to go everywhere where our clients lived. And once you saw the whole facility, you recognized that this is a problem that's gonna be very, very difficult to fix. Should we have done better? Yes. And should there have been more help? I, I agree, I think so, absolutely. But at the same time, I knew the administrators at Grafton. I knew so many of them working there. These were good people. And they were working with what they were provided in the way of funding. It's a very difficult situation. The state of North Dakota and the legislature, we did not do well enough. And we were trying to remedy that. In 1982, federal judge Bruce Van Sickle took the matter out of the legislature's hands. His ruling forced the state to deinstitutionalize the residents of the state school and fund programs to support them in community-based settings. At the time, we were moving a lot of people out of the developmental center. It was after the judge had ruled. Uh, there were timelines that uh, numbers of people needed to be moved out by. And so it was, as you can imagine, during the 80s, a real active time of moving literally hundreds of people out of the developmental center. It was a welcome change in many people's eyes. Instead of a single large state institution, a network of independent organizations in more than 30 communities across the state now provides housing, services, and support for people with developmental disabilities and their families. We have opened doors with the lawsuit, but whether that's going to be meaningful for people with disabilities is up to our local communities and how well they accept people with disabilities. Today, there are still some people who will look at people with disabilities as being somebody less, and that's a mistake. You don't get to know the person, you don't get to know what their abilities are, you're just going to write them off because they look different or they act different. If we're all a little more accepting of our differences, that would make life better for everybody, including people with disabilities. 30 years after the ARC decision, the lives of people with developmental disabilities have improved tremendously. But there are some who still believe that people with intellectual and developmental disabilities can't hold jobs, learn new skills, have relationships, or be nothing but a burden to society. Those myths are being disproved every day. Laura was brought to Grafton during a time when it was believed people with disabilities could never be independent and should be locked up for their own protection. Today, she holds down two jobs and owns her own condo. It's fun living in a condo so you don't have nobody to Tell what to do and you can do it in your way. Feels good. Nobody to bug you. 
Laura was eight years old when she came to Grafton after her mother was unable to care for her at home. And then she couldn't um, handle me no more. And then after that, she feel bad because she said, why I take her to the Grafton? She didn't know how Grafton, Grafton was. I didn't get to keep my watch and rings. That meant so much to me. Family was forgotten and dad's funeral was missed. Education was not for me because I was too good of a worker bee. The toilets didn't have the privacy we wished. Having clothes that fit was a lucky thing for me. Every time I asked to call my family, the answer was always no. For Laura and many Grafton residents, living at the state school meant being hundreds of miles away from their families. It was difficult to remain in touch, let alone take part in her family's lives. When Laura lost her father, she wasn't even permitted to attend his funeral. I feel sad, kind of scared, because you couldn't call nobody or kind of hurt. After being allowed to leave the state school, Laura chose to move to a community near her family, and now she sees them often. Laura lives independently in her condo, but receives support from a community program which helps her with some tasks she can't manage on her own. Cooking and paying bills or take me shopping, get some groceries or important stuff, such as nice people. Okay, Gail, you're free. Before the ARC decision, special education programs were few and far between. They were thought to be too expensive, and sometimes the unspoken thought was that it was a waste of money. But there were some parents, like Violet, who refused to accept that kind of limitation for their children. I made up my mind, I'm going to treat her, I'm going to do everything I can to make her be what she can be. But as the youngest in her family, Gail didn't think of herself as handicapped or incapable of doing anything her brother Peter and other siblings can do, including going to school. So her family sacrificed to make that happen. Well, I think um, all but I got lessons, I don't. Peter told me, and Peter, all the friends, uh, the school, he invited me and with Peter because uh, I work hard. There were no services at New England, but at three years old, we found out there was a school of promise in Bowman. Every Monday when it was possible, we would drive down to Bowman from New England, which is around 50 miles. I kept talking to the superintendent about getting some help, and he'd always just say, well, we're working on it. One day there was in the paper a project find, and it said we're looking for all the handicapped children for services. I said, I see that you're looking for handicapped children, and I said, I have a child here that's five years old, and she's getting no services. She said, well, we have a preschool program, but it's full. And I said, I'll work, I'll do anything just to get her into that program. One day when we were having coffee, I, I sort of laughed and I said to the teacher, I said, they said they were full and she said, we were, we could have never taken her if you hadn't said you'd work. Thanks to her mother's efforts, Gail was able to graduate from high school and even achieve her dream of attending a college class. When I was growing up, you did not see kids with Down syndrome. You did not see kids in wheelchairs. They were just not in the public school. Yeah, I make chicken. Yeah. The things that mom did for Gail are, are unbelievable because she wasn't about to just say, okay, then I'll just keep my child at home and whatever happens, happens. No, she kept pushing and pushing forward for Gail. And I, I mean, 
she pushed forward for all of us. Gail's brother Peter became a teacher because of the example set by his mother, and as fortune would have it, his own family benefited from her pioneering efforts. Gail and I are pretty close and we're pretty special to each other and I remember you know growing up saying you know someday I wouldn't mind having my own little child with Down syndrome and then sure enough that's what I have. That's Dad's job. Is this cold or hot? When the doctor came in and told us that they're going to test Zach for Down syndrome um, of course it's like a shock um, because you don't expect that when you give birth to a baby. I remember my mother-in-law, Vi, telling us, well, Good. you just have to work a little bit harder. So many times I tell Vi that it's because of parents like her that they paved the way for the next generation, and they really did. I can't imagine what it was like for Vi to not have those advocates for her there. When I think of all the help we get outside of our own home, there is no comparison. We, we've just got We've got life made compared to what it was like to raise Gail for Vi. I'm pretty quick. One of the arguments made during the ARC lawsuit was that individuals with disabilities would be a tremendous drain on community resources. Opponents of deinstitutionalization overlooked the idea that those very individuals might have something valuable to contribute. I'm the auditor for the city of Harvey and I oversee the financial aspects of the city. Habit Services run our recycling center. We own the building. Um, they own the stuff inside of it, and they perform all of our daily duties to recycle for the city of Harvey, and they do a wonderful job. This is the bailer. <laughs> Habit Services is just one of more than 30 organizations in North Dakota that foster community integration for adults with disabilities through jobs, education, and housing. The recycling center Habit Services operates for the city is both providing employment and a chance for workers to feel they are contributing something important to their community. I've been here for a long time and you know, I kind of like the job. I work in a community trying to keep myself busy. I like it a lot. I do the crush the boxes over there. Sometimes I get to run the plastic one, and then I'm mostly over there. <laughs> we put uh, like magazines in one box, newspapers in another, and junk mail in the other one. <laughs> the arrangement is working so well, Havit and the city are expanding their partnership. They've started curbside pickup for us, and they do a wonderful job. I like to ride garbage truck. I like to do that. We have a great service that works wonderfully. I'd love to see whatever other kind of partnership we can do with them, if it be some of their printing services or some stuffing of mailers. We certainly love to use them. They're a very valuable part of our community. I think everybody enjoys having a habit here. We see them all the time. They're just part of our community, like anybody. The evolution of the system has been remarkable. The evolution in attitude has been no less remarkable. People with disabilities are looked at differently today than they were back then. They aren't someone to be feared. They aren't looked at as uh, someone who needs to be isolated and segregated. Uh, if you walk through our local communities, you'll see folks with disabilities working. You'll see them out and about shopping. You'll see them paying taxes, holding down jobs. And that is light years from where we, where we were back in 1980. Hello, ma'am. Did you enjoy the program? That's good. Thanks for coming. No longer shut away behind bars, residents of the former state school are now giving back, contributing their time and energy as volunteers of the Grafton Community Helpers. Community Helpers program has been around for four to five years, and it kind of started out as a way for us to try and support people in establishing more community connections in an organized kind of way. 
One great big example is last year for the first time we participated with the Relay for Life Committee and the committee would spend oh three-fourths of a day from nine o'clock till almost three four o'clock filling the bags the sandbags for the luminaries our crew went out there last year and they were done by noon and the committee is like we need these guys back next year they're our best volunteers ever and everybody was just having a great great time it's not just in the grafton local community that people are involved in activities in they travel over to park river They've done some work at the Humane Society when things needed to be taken care of there. Just lots of different opportunities that they've partaken in. And at first it was us using our staff connections to get people involved in the community and then pretty soon they're calling individuals that live here and saying, hey Anthony, can you help us out? You know, hey Barb, can you come and do this? And so people were creating their own connections eventually and, and now we're so busy we can hardly even keep up with the volunteer requests that are made of the gang. It's really exciting and awesome. Thank you. Yeah. When we do these programs at the Lutheran Sunset Home and stuff, we're actually entertaining the elderly and giving them something that they can look forward to. First I thought there was things that I could be doing that um, were more um, of my time, like focusing on things I do here and also with my work. And then I realized this is something that will help other people and also I'd say to myself, well, I like to sing, I like to talk to people, and I like to show my talents, so maybe this is a good way to bring those talents out. I think anyone who helps someone reach their full potential and gets to where they need to be in their lives and their community is, I think, a great step that anyone can take. I came here for help and understanding of some things and also getting, uh, getting my life back in order. And I feel with, um, with things I've been doing here in Grafton, here I've been making a lot of progress. And in the past, when I first came here, I wasn't very adept to doing anything. There was times where I was like against the system. Things are doing better for me and I've gotten so many social roles and so many things I can do in my life. It just seems like even though I'm still here, I'm just, making such a difference while I'm working my way out. There's a lot of people that are committed to making a difference in other people's lives as I am. I put the word out there for community helpers. I see if uh, with help of others who wants to join and um, who wants to be a part of their society more and community. And I think accessing their talents and actually bringing their skills into the community and showing people what they're worth, even if they're handicapped or can't do much. Showing that talent and bringing those people out of their, like bringing out of their shell and then having them say, I can be a part of my community. I'm just happy to be a part of that each time we do the group and go to the community and stuff with our talent. Got that it's not just as volunteers where people with disabilities can use their skills and abilities. They can also be valued, productive employees. Anywhere between 30 to 40 percent of the employees in the food court are uh, individuals with disabilities. When we opened the food court, I had every confidence in the world that this was a direction to go with some of our employment. Eleven years later, I'm proven right every day. Colin came to live in Grafton after the death of his mother and took part in a program to gain the skills to support himself as an adult. We had dog coaches who can't in and they can't, one can't at 10 and works with somebody till noon. Then we had a second one at noon who can't and works with us. And then after that, they leave. After that, go work someplace else, they do. We're into our 11th year right now. Things are working out great. Colin's been a, a great employee. He's always on time, rarely calls in sick. Uh, a lot of times we have to ask him to take his vacation because he has too much vacation on the books. And then just as far as, you know, the duties, he's always willing to help out and do whatever is expected in the food court. It's so these out and then then I bring these to 
those red ones and those red ones, that's where these go to. Although Colin is an employee of the mall, he continues to receive on-the-job support services from a community provider. His job coach assists him with making sure he clocks in, he has his name badge on, he has his apron tied. We need help tying the apron, right? And then the job coach will assist him as needed and kind of monitor his job until about 1 o'clock and then that job coach will leave at one and then Colin will perform his job duties with support from his co-workers. Sometimes we, we write tales, sometimes we empty gods or do as, do trades and in the afternoon where it's five to four, it's time for me to lead then. He loves his work here. Where things have changed over the years, if people don't love their job and want to be at their job, then it's our job to assist them with finding something else. People have choice. I think the people that we work with are striving to be part of that middle class, and they're, they're striving to do the kinds of things and have the kinds of lives that, that everybody wants to have family, to have friends, to have a job, to have a home, to have social activities in the community, to have relationships with other people. So those differences fall away and their lives look more like our lives and that's a good thing. There we go, no, get on there. Despite his blindness and other disabilities, like any other entrepreneur, Darren works hard to make a go of his custom popcorn business. But it's not just money that drives him to succeed. I don't really care that much about the pay. It's uh, just the uh, rec recognition that I like. The popcorn business is like our child. I've always just wanted for Darren to have something that was his. And he's really proud when he talks about it. He says, I have a small popcorn business. It's a real pride issue. There was a time when four or five different kids, and one of them was nudging his friend like, he can't see, you know. And this old, this old kid was just totally, totally amazed at what I was doing. And he would walk up, see me doing it, and he'd come closer and closer, and he'd tell me, you can see, can't you? No, I do not see. When Darren first started Popcorn, his first job coach had real reservations about him putting his hands inside that machine because of the hot kettle and everything. There we go, now get down there. And I said to Darren, I said, there's no reason why you can't do this to yourself. And so we made adaptations. We were worried about the hot pot and everything, so we got the gloves. And he puts the glove on and he can reach in there and if he touches against the pot by accident, it doesn't burn. Okay, all done. There have been burns. Everybody has the right to risk something. Everybody deserves to have the dignity of risk. Last month, we just finished a very big job. The, the new Sanford Hospital, this lady, she had found our website and she wanted 1,000 servings of popcorn. Lori and I were up 10 hours doing that, and that was quite a job. Would you like to hear a joke? I would. What's the best place to keep your baseball glove? I don't know. In the glove compartment. <laughs> In the glove compartment, Oh. For some people with disabilities, technology can help them achieve a level of independence in small ways that have a large impact on the quality of their life. My name is Samuel Leo Irie. I go 
coach of Valley City Junior High, I really like. Football. Denver Broncos. Sam has his iPad too, which he uses. He gets to pick what he'd like to say, and then I help him. He can add pictures or symbols, and then just click a done button and it's right there. You said something about going to Dairy Queen. Mm -hmm. What if they said if you got an ice cream cone and it cost one dollar, what would you pay with? <gasps> the dollar bill? <gasps> yeah, good job. I work with Sam in the school setting as like a paraeducator, but also at home, direct support professional. So throughout a day, any daily needs, wants, we hang out, go through his daily schedule together. Can you go to your home page? Okay, where do we share our news, our messages? Sam lives in a group home, but he has his own room here. It is his own house. Sam's dad passed away about two years ago, so it became a little harder for mom because he has two other sisters. With Sam being here, he gets more focus and attention, and they are still able to meet together since his family lives in Valley City, and they do church and sporting events, but when they're together, it's more focus on good quality family time. Although Sam can't talk, it doesn't mean he can't communicate. I really like football. Like many teenage boys, Sam loves sports, and it's a favorite topic of iPad conversation with his support staff. What else have you been doing? You got to go to the Red Hawks game and had lots of fun? Oh, for fun! Did they win? They did? Did they win or lose? They lost? Oh man, maybe they'll do better next time. They're no different than anybody else. Go in and talk to them, they might surprise you. Like with Sam, you could walk up and start a conversation. If he had his iPad, he could come out and start the conversation or the topics for you. Just watch and you'll learn and feed off of the vibe they're giving you. It is hard, but the rewards you get, the feedback you get back outweighs the bad days. I like packing up the posty. Sometimes, even though an individual may be capable of independent living, it does not mean the road will run smooth. Sometimes, course corrections are needed. Burke would refuse to get up and go to work in the morning because what the theory was is other people were doing it, so he thought he could too. He just didn't feel the need to work. He's kind of a laid back kind of guy to put it nicely, where if he didn't have to do anything, he wouldn't. He's only 50 some years old and he's not ready to retire yet and sit at home on the couch. And at that time, there was really no incentive or he didn't feel the incentive to go to work. Like to play hockey. I'm staying in bed and pretending that I was sick. Burke did not seem motivated by the abstract concept of a paycheck, so his support team developed a more tangible system of rewards. There was a pop program. He would get up to three pops a day for doing certain things. So in order to do those things, he'd have to get out of bed. The first pop of the day was getting up and going to work. If he didn't do that, he would miss that pop at work. So some days, if he already was already messing it up, he just would say, whatever. I'm not going to get my pop anyways. I'm not going to work. So then we started incentive with me. We would go out to lunch every Friday if he got up and went to work every day. Yeah, but I don't play hooky. Michelle um, um, sometimes take me out to eat if I go to work on time. Burke's girlfriend, Annie, has also contributed to his turnaround. How you do, Mifta? She helps motivate him. If he doesn't have a good day, she doesn't want to come and see him because he needs to get up and go to work and that's just what people do, she says. So I, I'm not going to see him today and he won't get a hug. <laughs> there was a few times in the beginning where he faltered because he wouldn't get up, he wouldn't go, and he would end up taking a cab. And there was two things that happened when that happened. He wouldn't go out to lunch with me and he wouldn't be able to go out on his, what he calls his hot date on the weekend with his girlfriend. I don't do that no more. Now I get up. Since November, I come to work every day. Good job, darling. You're welcome. 
I like that word, Donna. Oh. Before the lawsuit, residents of Grafton lived in large, crowded, noisy group wards with no private space. Residents would deliberately act out in order to be put in isolation, just to get a little peace and quiet. After the ARC lawsuit, community support programs were able to match individuals to the kind of living arrangements that fit their personalities and needs. Zach lived at home until he was 16 and then there was some turmoil in the family and he was moved into an adolescent home in Dickinson. There was too much activity in the home that he was living in and he started self-abusing. He would bang on his head, chew his hands. Our home was picked for him to come down here. It's low key, it's quiet, and he fit in very, very nicely here. Zach is a very, he's a passionate person. He's very caring. He's fun to have around. He giggles and pulls jokes on us. My role in Zach's life is to help him get the best out of his life, what he can get. Zach is Native American and his room is decorated like that. He attends the powwow in Bismarck every year. In Grafton, they didn't have a quality of life. Here they actually get a quality of life. They get to pick out their what their room looks like and if they want to live in that home and who they want to live with. They have those choices, whereas Grafton, they didn't have those choices. Long-term committed relationships are as possible for people with disabilities as they are for anyone else. Nora and Darwin met at work almost 40 years ago, and they've been together ever since. Right here. And her and I hit it off good, so we... We're still together. We're still together, yeah. So far. <laughs> with family help, they were able to achieve one of Nora's dreams, owning their own home. Well, we've been renting, and I, I don't know. I don't like to rent. No, I'd don't. rather have my own place. Our own house, it's only better having our own house. But like scrubbing the floors, doing dishes, making beds. I like doing things like that. I like to do things for myself. Since he's broke his hip, the doctor thought he never could walk, but I proved to him that he was going to walk. Mm -hmm. I said, you're good and faithful to take me out for exercise. Good little doctor, I call her. And then the time came for Darwin to become the caregiver. Well, I guess the way it happened, I went to get something and Darwin said, you don't feel good, do you? And I said, nothing's going to happen. Down I went. It was a major heart attack, but despite doctor's expectations, she and Darwin are still at home. I will help out my sweetheart somehow. We do what we can. This is my hobby, and I like doing it. If it wasn't for Grafton, I would have never learned this stuff. Helen has also exceeded the expectations others had for her. It might not have seemed possible at the time she was born, but Helen has taken charge of her own life. I was born in Minot, November 5th, 1942, shortly after I was born, I was in the Fargo Orphanage Home. And then from there, in 1943, somebody took me to a place called Grafton State School because of my, my health. 
I needed extra care. And they didn't think I could do things. I could do a lot of things, except for jump rope. Can't do that. Ironically, it was while she was a ward of the state that Helen began to become responsible, not only for herself, but others as well. I used to take care of kids, so I took care of the little boys and girls on such a five. It was a lot of work, taking care of kids and folding clothes and all that, plus going to school. It was kind of both ways, good and bad. I see the good stuff more than I see the bad. Helen tries to focus on the good memories of Grafton, but there is one sadness she is not able to let go of. I didn't really meet my mom, because she died when I was still at Grafton. And my dad called up to the school and said, don't let Helen come to my dad, because she might take it too hard. What if I took it hard? At least I would have seen her face. That's how I see it. I got to meet my dad, but he was very nice. But I didn't know why they gave me up. But I always say, I wanted to see them close together, face to face, but it didn't happen. I would have liked to, that was my first wish, to see them together. So I don't wish for things anymore, and they don't come true. Since leaving Grafton, Helen has tried to help others gain as much control over their lives as they are capable of. Self-advocacy solution is when I started from the Ark of the Valley, well, the real purpose is that people want to know how to speak up to their staff. And there's a lot of them are scared to speak up. And that's a part of self-advocacy is. It's learning to speak up. When this picture is with the governor from the sign, sign that I word off the map. But Grafton didn't know anything about self-advocates. And you're born with it. And you're born with your rights. Those times, they didn't see it that way. You have to speak up to get what you want. Mary Jo has never been shy about speaking her mind or making decisions for herself. I can do everything! But her parents went to court when she became an adult to retain legal guardianship in some areas of her life. The hard part about guardianship is in order to be, become a guardian, you have to take some rights away from a person. Look at my legs, go! Some people don't believe in guardianship. They believe that, that people with, with disabilities need to be free. Because of, of Mary Jo's vulnerability with finances and her very serious and persistent medical problems, um, my husband and I decided we needed to pursue at least a limited guardianship for her. Since the guardianship was established, she's had to have another heart surgery, and she's had two pacemaker insertions. So she's had some major medical issues going on. And my concern was she may not fully understand the significance of major medical issues and may refuse something that would be life-saving or very critical to her existence. Wow. She's been assertive. I mean, she never had, has had to have assertiveness lessons. She was born assertive. Now that her heart condition is under control, Mary Jo is stepping back into training as a Special Olympics athlete. Where sports are concerned, Mary Jo is not just assertive, she's downright competitive. Do you want to run down do the loop just once? No. Of course. Yeah? Sound yeah. good? I'm running three miles and 66 laps. Is it more than that? I could train a lot more before the race in the month of September. I'm going to do it. 
I'll be in there with a gold medal for me. When Mary Jo puts her mind to something, she is unstoppable. Her current project is learning Italian so that she can speak with her sister-in-law in her native language. I got this Netflix computer. I look up Italian words on it. I want to learn more math, history, math, and sign language. I'm not afraid. I want to do it. Okay, now you want some popcorn? Yep. Okay, let's figure out the points. My relationship with Mary Jo. Um, well, we started out mother and daughter, and we're still mother and daughter, but as she's become an adult, we're kind of more like roommates, partners, friends here, although sometimes the mother-daughter role has to come into play <laughs> as well when she needs advice and, and guidance. Zero points. <laughs> Good job. When Virginia first learned she was going to have a child with Down syndrome, she couldn't have imagined Mary Jo as the feisty, independent young woman she became. The first question that came out of my mouth, the very first question, not even thinking, he said, the baby has Down syndrome. I said, what's going to happen to her when we die? You take in the whole thing, and it's overwhelming. You can't do that. You have to plan for the future, but back off and just take it one day at a time, sometimes one hour at a time. We have learned many lessons since the ARC lawsuit. You see it in our schools, in our workplaces, in stores and restaurants and playgrounds. But nowhere are those changes more obvious than the transformation that is taking place at the Developmental Center in Grafton. This institution one time had a couple thousand residents living on it. 2011, we'd set a goal uh, for 97, we reached that goal. And the next goal, we're looking at a number between 65 and 75 individuals. Although the State Developmental Center has gotten much smaller, it has not closed. Given the success of the community-based services that have developed over the last 30 years, some wonder whether the center has a future. I believe that there is a need to have a safety net. We see people in crisis in the community. You're really a good around here, aren't you? My worry would be is that if you did not have a resource like this for that safety net, short-term stays, I'm not talking about, you know, long, long stays, but short-term stays, they're better served here if you had that safety net than they would be in a state hospital. If there's a behavioral issue, we can work with them, they can, things can calm down, they can return to their back to their independent living arrangement and things would be better for them in the community. That service is definitely necessary and we need to continue to provide that. My concern is if you don't have that, as I indicated, you end up uh, being placed in an environment that's not appropriate for you. And state psychiatric hospital is not appropriate for these individuals. That's the bottom line. Not only has the population gotten smaller, but the underlying philosophy has changed tremendously as well. We work towards people's goals and dreams, you know, versus um, when I started it was people being busy. Now we actually are asking people what do they want to do with their lives, where do they want to go, what are their dreams, what are their goals, and it's just kind of awesome the work that's being done to help people support their goals. I think more and more people are becoming more integrated in the community and having experiences that are more like you and I. People aren't in the background. They're not faded into institutions. They're with us and they're involved in community life. I think their quality of life is better because they are doing the things that they want to do versus in the days prior they did things that we thought they should want to do and they didn't necessarily match up. So I think people are just happier with their lives.
Since Judge Van Sickle's ruling in 1982, life has changed for individuals with developmental and intellectual disabilities, whether they live at home with family, in independent living arrangements, or in group settings, they have come a long way from the crowded back wards of the state institution. When you compare what life is like today for the people who moved out of the developmental center and into community programs, life is so much richer today than it was before in every way imaginable, in the ways we can measure and in the ways you can't measure. richer in opportunities, richer in social involvement, richer in activities, richer in job satisfaction, richer in relationships, richer in community involvement. Everything you look at, the people who have moved from the institution into the community programs will tell you that life is so much better today that you can't even imagine it. I got involved with this case less than a year out of law school, and I was not smart enough to know what I was getting into. But when I look back at it, it has been nothing but a blessing to me to be a part of something like this. Like anyone, people with developmental or intellectual disabilities have goals they are reaching for. Some may be attainable, some may not, but it is our hopes and dreams that make us who we are. Hey, Roberta. Hey, Cassie. I'm trying to take a trip somewhere, but I'm not sure yet where. I'd like to travel around the world when I get older. <laughs> I'd like to go on a cruise someday. That went very well, didn't it? Yeah. Should we take some of these off and pawn them? Yeah. To have to go home and see the family. What I would like to see for Zach in the future. His grandma is a very important part of his life. I would love to see him see his family more. I can raise more money, I get my own apartment, I get my own place, and I cook my own food in the microwave. You're gonna go fishing <laughs> and catch a really big fish in Canada, and you are gonna snap a picture of it. Go to the garbage and then put your broom away. I would like to see him where he has a job out in the community. I don't care if it's stacking shelves at Dan's County Market. I just hope and dream that his job in life is something beneficial to the community and beneficial to himself. So we'll bag this one up for Blue Cross and Blue Shield. I think you will let people become more aware of myself. that I'm not just someone in a chair who doesn't know anything. I want people for, to know that you are a person and that you have your own mind. Yeah. I would like to say that they should listen to it and not try to go back to institutions. We can do almost just as much as people that have two good hands. My dad and all my family are great role models to me. and. Every day that I can do something for him to show him how proud he is of me, I'm, I'm glad to do that. Maybe one day get an Oscar or something for music, or a Grammy or a Country Music Award buckle. Well, I like to do everything. You gotta keep moving. For more information about community service providers near you, go to www.ndacp.org.
to order a DVD copy of I Am a Person, call 1-800-359-6900 or visit our online store at www.prairiepublic.org and click on Shop. Production funding for this program is provided by the North Dakota Association of Community Providers through a grant from the North Dakota State Council on Developmental Disabilities and by the members of Prairie Public.